We've talked a lot about the digestive system so far. We know more now about digestive enzymes. We know uh, quite a bit about the liver and the stomach and even some about the salivary glands. Now I'd like to try and put things together in a description of how the different macronutrients get digested. Uh, first off, what are macronutrients? Macronutrients are nutritional things that the human body needs in large amounts. And they are essentially fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. So we're going to start with how proteins get digested and absorbed. Uh, let's start with step number one, that proteins do not start to be digested until they get down to the stomach. And it's down in the stomach where they will be acted on by hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is not an enzyme, but it will denature the proteins, which makes the job of the enzymes somewhat easier to do. So hydrochloric acid will act on the proteins. And then uh, pepsinogen has been turned into pepsin by cleavage by hydrochloric acid. And then pepsin is going to start working on uh, the proteins. The job of pepsin will be to take uh, really big proteins like, I don't know, like the myosin that's in the muscle of the steak that you just ate, right? And it'll take those big proteins and chop them up into just random chunks of smaller protein. Uh, so pepsin digests proteins into smaller polypeptides. Um, polypeptides are sequences of amino acids that are pretty long by themselves, still way too big to be absorbed into the bloodstream, but easier to work on. Um, let me reiterate that when um, the different enzymes are digesting these macronutrients, they're not just chopping it at any old covalent bond, they're cutting them apart into their monomers ultimately. And that means for the final exam, that all of the enzymes that are proteases, they specifically break peptide bonds because peptide bonds are the type of covalent bonds that hold one amino acid together to the adjacent amino acid. Now, pepsin, when I think about pepsin, frankly, I think of it as some sort of demon-possessed Benny Hanna robot with a cleaver, okay? It's just in my brain. Um, it is a wacky, powerful, incredibly dangerous protein. And right now, all of the food that you ate with the proteins that are in it are about to go into the small intestine. The small intestine has no actual defense against this insane uh, enzyme, except um, it is um, going to have a different pH and that will make all of the difference. Um, when we get down into the duodenum, the first thing that's going to happen is that the duodenum itself, the duodenum, those Brunner's glands, they're going to send in bicarbonate. Um, in addition, the duodenum is going to send out cholecystokinin, which will tell the pancreas to send in uh, bicarbonate and uh, digestive enzymes. All of that bicarbonate is going to change the pH of this acid stuff that has been in your stomach from a pH down around two or three up to a pH of eight or nine. And that means that this wickedly powerful demon possessed whatever uh, enzyme pepsin, it will be denatured. It doesn't seem like something that is that powerful that it can do that much damage at a pH of two. It doesn't seem like it should be so sensitive to a pH. Um, of seven, but actually even at a pH of seven, pepsin is completely denatured. It has become harmless. So if you're ever being pursued by a demon possessed Benihana robot, try throwing pH seven at it. Could work. Right? So the pancreas, <clears throat> the pancreas will send in more bicarbonate. Oh, I think that's on the final exam too. Um, and it also will send in enzymes. Some of the enzymes it sends in are zymogens. Let me reiterate that zymogens are, I say usually proteases, they're always proteases. And the ones that are created by the pancreas are trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase. Trypsinogen will be cleaved 
and become trypsin when um, an enzyme that is a brush border enzyme that's inside of the that's inside uh, and attached to the duodenum uh, cleaves it. And then trypsin will go ahead and cleave his friends, chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase into their mature forms, chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase. But the pancreas makes other enzymes too. The pancreas makes an amylase. Any starch that has made it through the stomach and is not yet broken down into uh, small sugars um, will also be broken down by pancreatic amylase. The pancreas also makes a lipase. Remember, we had lingual lipase. Now we've got pancreatic lipase. Uh, the pancreas also makes enzymes that can break down RNA and DNA, um, and, uh, but those are not considered macronutrients. So remember that the pancreas has got two roles in human physiology. It is a role in the digestive system because it makes all of these enzymes, but it also plays a role in the endocrine system because it makes insulin. This slide is just a recap of the activation of these zymogens. Uh, these zymogens, um, trypsinogen gets activated by enterokinase, and then it becomes trypsin, and then it activates its friends. Okay, and then we had one other zymogen, which was pepsinogen that got activated by hydrochloric acid. And all of the proteases, all of the proteases, not just the zymogens, but all proteases, they break peptide bonds. I don't know why it's there's so much. Yes, the zymogen summary, great, okay. Um, but there's more. I have asked you in the study guide to be able to follow the digestion of protein, carbohydrate, and lipid um, from the mouth all the way to the heart. Um, we are, are going to talk about that a little bit more, but before I move on to carbohydrates, let's go back to talking about um, the absorption of proteins. Proteins will be digested and broken apart into individual amino acids. As amino acids, they will be actively transported by these cells right down here. Those cells will actively transport them into their cells and then they will diffuse into the blood. Since they diffuse into the blood, they're at the capillaries of the villus. They will go into the venous system and they will go into the hepatic portal vein and they will travel through all of those sinusoids of the liver capillaries before that gets gathered up into the hepatic vein and hence ends up going back to the heart. All right. Good. Now let's talk about carbohydrates. The digestion of carbohydrates is much easier. It is much easier for us to digest carbohydrates than to digest proteins. So digestion of carbohydrates happens faster. The salivary amylase was working while you were chewing but it will be stopped when it reaches the pH of the stomach because it stops working at a pH of about 4.5 and the stomach's a lot more acid than that. But no worries, um, once the starch that has made it through the stomach, here it's made it through the stomach and now it's in the duodenum, uh, it'll bump into pancreatic amylase. And pancreatic amylase will break it down into what are known as oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides are very large sugars smaller than starches, but bigger than our typical sugars. Our typical sugars are things that are monosaccharides or disaccharides. Um, so they will be broken down into oligosaccharides. So uh, uh, monosaccharides, like three or four or five of them stuck together, that will be an oligosaccharide. And that happens super fast because it's a relatively easy job for an enzyme to do, at least for starches. There are complex carbohydrates in our food that we cannot digest easily. And those are the things that we call fiber. Um, we will be talking about water soluble fiber uh, in, a later, in a later video. Okay, now uh, pancreatic amylase has broken the starch down into these oligosaccharides. And then there are a whole bunch of different brush border enzymes. Yes. Enterokinase was a brush border enzyme. 
it was one that acted on proteins. But now we're talking about brush border enzymes that act on oligosaccharides, and their job is to break them down into individual monosaccharides like glucose or fructose or galactose. And those things will be absorbed by these same simple columnar epithelial cells that are covering all of the villi that line the small intestine. The, uh, the uh, brush border enzymes that are there um, are going to put those sugars into the bloodstream. And since it goes into the blood, after that, the sugars are going to get gathered up ultimately into the hepatic portal vein. And from the hepatic portal vein, it'll go up through the liver and it'll be distributed through all of the sinusoids of the liver. And then whatever the liver doesn't use will get gathered up into the hepatic vein. And from there, it'll head to the inferior vena cava and back to the heart. So the after being absorbed into the bloodstream at the villi, the path that amino acids take from the digestion of protein and the path that sugars take from the digestion of starches and other carbohydrates, after they get absorbed, then their pathway is the same. Oh, I just wanted to make a point. Did I make it on an earlier slide? That um, the brush border enzyme that allows you to digest milk sugar, milk sugar is known as lactose, it's a disaccharide. The name of that enzyme is lactase, of course it is. We know that enzymes names end in ASE and that the rest of the word is designed to tell us what it digests, right? Um, after about the age of four in most humans, and by most humans, really 75% of humanity, we quit making that enzyme. And because of that, um, the milk sugar called lactose is no longer digestible for those of us that no longer make that enzyme. And that will make it so that lactose, milk sugar, cannot be um, digested and absorbed in your small intestine. As a result, lactose will end up going all the way down to your large intestine where there are many, many bacteria present. And those bacteria will say, thank you very much and enjoy the lactose, but create a very smelly gas and also byproducts that can cause uh, intestinal uh, upset. And this process we call lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is not an allergy to milk. Lactose intolerance is just being a normal mammal who quits making lactase when you get to be about four years old. You probably have seen that there are um, milk products that are lactose free, and you might wonder how that happens. Well, you could give it a little bit of thought. If you had a perfectly good gallon of milk and you wanted it to be safe for you to drink, but you don't make lactase anymore, how would you do that? Well, you could just add a little bit of the enzyme lactase to the milk and all of the lactose in the milk would get digested into glucose and galactose. That's what lactose is made out of. And then the milk would be slightly sweeter to the taste, slightly, but it would be completely safe to drink. So that's what lactose-free milk is. Lactose-free milk is simply regular milk that before it gets to the grocery store, they've added a little bit of the enzyme lactase, and now it is safe to drink. All right, we will start there at the beginning of the next video.